Welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in Balak. We're, we're, we're in, not, we're not, we're in Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> we're in Numbers 22, which is Balak and Balaam. And we're in Psalm 62 and 63. Two wonderful, wonderful psalms. An amazing passage of scripture. Let's pray. Let's go. <laughs> Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your word. Thank you for the rich variety in your word. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning and that we can pray and ask you this morning for forgiveness and mercy and ask you to have pity upon our, our souls and please feed us today. Give us this day our daily bread. You've said man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Lord, as we read your word, please feed us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab. Hold on a minute, where are we? The plains of Moab, that's where Israel ended up before they crossed into the promised land. Mm -hmm. The plains of Moab is where God gives the last of the Pentateuch through Moses before the Israelites enter the promised land. God is going to give the book of Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And Moses is going to give this these speeches to the people of Israel all on the plains of Moab. But before they can have any of that, mm -hmm. they've got some problems with the people in the region, and here it says in verse 2, Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was in great dread of the people, because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel, and Moab said to the elders of Midian, this horde will now lick up all that is around us, as the ox licks up the grass of the field. Now, have you ever seen an ox licking up the grass of the field? Well, they had, and they knew that that was how it was like. Oxes just go along, and they just kind of go like that with their tongues, and they just looks like they're licking up the grass, and they're eating grass basically. Same with cows. So, but they can eat. They can eat a lot of grass. They just you know, got a field full of grass. You put some up some cows in there and the grass is quickly gone mm -hmm. so uh, that's the picture so Balak the son of Zippor that's the king who was king of Moab at that time sent messengers to Balaam son of Beor at Pethor which is near the river in the land of the people of Amor seems like everything ended in the sound or uh -huh. anyway Beor, Pethor Amor, Zippor anyway you get the picture. And what did he say? To call him. So he's calling Balaam. Balaam's this weird prophet figure. Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. Right, stop there. Huh, yeah. So these people realized and recognized that the people of Israel had come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth. And they are now, they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me. So he's asking Balaam as some kind of prophet guy, a bit like a witch doctor prophet by the seams of it, by, by the appearance of it, um, to curse Israel since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I will be able to defeat them and drive them from the land for I know that he whom you bless is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed. Now that's interesting because Balak is saying about Balaam, the prophet, that Balaam is, is a bit like God. And whoever Balaam blesses is blessed and whoever Balaam curses is cursed. That's the kind of thing that you could only really say of God. That's just an interesting phrase, isn't it? Crops up elsewhere. Now, so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with fees for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. Now, where was Balaam again? Oh, yes, Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the, of the, in the land of the people of Amor. 
Now, it's believed that that was over near to Babylon and that Balaam was one of the, the ancestors of the Magi. Hmm. So there we are, one of, one of the Magi. Anyway, that's the picture that we get. And it's interesting when you come to some of Balaam's oracles later, hmm. and he says, out of star. Judah a star hmm. shall arise. And, and maybe all those years later, the, the wise men, the Magi who came and found Jesus, maybe they knew Balaam's prophecy. Anyway. Hmm. All right, so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the feast for divination in the hand, and they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. Now notice that mm. word Lord. What is it? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. If you were re reading the LSB, it would say mm. Yahweh. Okay. As Yahweh speaks to me, so the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, and I think, I think Balaam is a false prophet. He's at least a corrupt prophet. I don't think he's a real prophet of Yahweh, but we'll see why in a bit. God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, so Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go down with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak sent princes, more in number and more honourable than these. So these are the, the higher princes. They would look and feel more rich and powerful. And why do you think Balak sent those to Balaam? Because then Balaam will get like treasures. Because he's these right, pieces. so he's going to think, oh, these are more powerful, more rich, more influential people. I could get more from them if I if I gave give Balak what he wants, then. I'm going to get more, more power, more position, more influence. This is not just anybody coming to see me. Look at these great people, and they want me to do this. If I do it for them, I'll be great. I'll be rich. Look at what he says. Verse 16, And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me. For I will surely do you great honour, and whatever you say to me, I will do. In other words, name your fee. Name your price. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God, that's Yahweh my God, to do less or more. So he's still claiming to be a servant claiming to be a prophet of Yahweh, isn't he? I don't think he is, but he's claiming to be. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do anything that Yahweh didn't tell me to do. Uh, so you too, please stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Oh, hold on a minute. God has made it plain to him, hasn't he? What did God say to him previously? You can't curse them because they're blessed, right? Mm. So it's interesting, isn't it? They, they say to Balaam, well, Balak says to Balaam, I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. When, when Balaam comes to God, he, he's, uh, he, he says, Balak's come to me saying all this stuff. He doesn't quote that bit, does he? Because he knows really that he's nothing. But he's, when, Balak, when God appears to Balaam, Balaam leaves that bit out and then 
God says, don't curse them because they're blessed. And he so he sends them away. He must be terrified because God has actually appeared to him. And then now these people have come back. And you say, well, why didn't he just send them away and say, God's told me no already. There's nothing I can do. Why does he say stay the night? Because he wants a better, better answer so he can actually get the riches. Exactly. He wants a different answer from God. Now, now think about that for a moment. When God has made it clear that it's no, mm -hmm. if you go back to God and, 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 and if you're saying... I mean, if God's word says something is wrong, for instance, let's say, I don't know, so let's say you're a, you're a Christian and you want to marry a non-Christian. Mm. And God's word has said it's, n it's no. The answer's no. And you go back to God saying, oh, please, oh, but, but I want to... I, maybe if I ask like this, if you said to me, and let me give you an example, if you said to me, Dad, does this top, is this top okay for me to wear? And I said, you can't wear that. That's totally immodest. That's, it would just be wrong to wear a top like that. You can't wear that. Imagine that. And I just said, no way. <clears throat> All right. Then, if you came back to me again and, 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 and said, well, no, let me go back to Dad again. See what he's going to say. Another time. Well, it would just be, if I've made it clear that it's absolutely clear, and there's no doubt about it, or if God's word makes it clear that it's definitely wrong, when you come back a second time, you're showing that you, 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 you know, Balaam's showing here, I really, really, really want their money. Oh, can't we find a way to change your mind, God? I know you said... They're blessed. But could we not, you know, can it maybe, can't we come up with a different answer? Huh? Mm. So what do you want? You want God to change his mind, right? That's one thing to want your dad to change his mind. There's another thing to want God to change his mind. Now, um, and God came to Balaam in the night and said to, the, said to him, if the men have come to call you, rise, go with them. But only do what I tell you. Now, a lot of people stumble at this point. And it's in, in, in my Bible, I've written the word sarcasm next to this. And I think you have to get it like this. So if you came to me and you said, Dad, what do you think about this top? And I said, no way, you're not wearing that. That's just immodest. That's, that's totally a no. And then you came back the next day and you said, Dad, but it's, but it's sunny outside. And I said to you, oh, well, if it's sunny then, if it's sunny, um, well, I'll wear it then. Would I be actually giving you permission? No, that's called sarcasm. You know it well, don't you? Because you get a lot of it in this house. <laughs> sarcasm is not sinful, by the way. God is sarcastic. And this is a good example. So God said, said if, if the... If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them. So he's saying, "Oh, really? So, so Balaam, you, you think it's you think I'm going to change my mind, do you? All right then. Well, let's see how this plays out, shall we? If if they've come to call you, go with them. So I, I think you've got to hear it like that because watch what happens next. So Balaam rose. In the morning and saddled the donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went. And you say, well, how can God be angry with him because he went? If God's just told him, go with them, it was because God wasn't really saying go with them. He was being sarcastic. He was saying, oh, wow, well, if they've come to call you, go with them. But did God want Balaam to go with them? No, he'd already made that clear. And that's why I would say this story gives you a very powerful lesson listen be careful what you ask god for because if it's god has already said no clearly and you know that's the case god may give you what you ask for but it will be a judgment upon you 
I can think of people who've <clears throat> done that with marriage. Like, I know God says don't marry an unbeliever. I know that, but... But, oh God, this man or this woman, or oh, just please. And, and, and then they, they say, oh, well, providentially, God allowed me to do it. So it must be, God must be okay with it. No, God's made it plain what he's okay with and what he's not okay with. Mm. If God allows you to walk into sin, it'll be for your judgment. You watch. Mm. God's anger was kindled because he went and the anger... Angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Adversary, which is it? Anyway, and now he was riding on the donkey. I love this story. Now he was riding on the donkey and his two servants were with him and the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand and the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. Now you know what that's like. You're on a horse and a horse pushes your foot against the wall. It hurts. It hurts, right. So he struck her again. And the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the left or to the right, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. I think you could probably give a name to this donkey, couldn't you? (laughs) The name of the last horse you had, which wouldn't do what you wanted. (laughs) Except it wouldn't really fit her. It's a boy's name. Oh, it's a boy's name, okay. Anyway, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. That's pretty... Strong discipline. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. (laughs) He's so angry he's talking to a donkey. (laughs) And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, no. (laughs) (laughs) Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. That's interesting, isn't it? Because he's just said, I wish I had a hand sword in my hand so that I could kill you. And then he's God open, opens his eyes, and there's, a, there's the angel of the Lord with his drawn sword. Whoops. Mm. Whoops. Okay. This is a bit like Nathan confronting David, isn't it? God's bringing Balaam to the point where he's like, you, the... With the, he's, he wants to kill the donkey because the donkey just won't go where he wants him to. Well, hang on a minute. What's Balaam doing? Balaam has been told by the Lord, don't go with them, don't curse them because they're blessed. And now Balaam's going where God doesn't want him to. And there's a sword drawn in his hand. And it's interesting, isn't it? There's a bit of a bit of a play of situations going on here. Anyway, um, and he bowed down and fell on his face. Verse 32, and the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. Perverse. It's twisted, isn't it? Reckless is the footnote. I'm sorry, I didn't look up the word. So I should have done, but we got talking about Israel. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Which is interesting, isn't it? See, 
this, I know I'm about to say Jesus, the angel of the Lord. Is this the pre-incarnate Jesus? I don't know for sure, but it's quite possible. But the angel of the Lord is, is kind of willing to let the donkey live. But there's a bit of a poignant moment there when Balaam wants to kill the donkey and 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 the angel is saying it's you that's the problem. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, for I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. All right, so now he's been brought to this point, and the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. All right, now he's committed, and, and, and this is the providence of God, isn't it? Sometimes we commit ourselves down one path, and even when we're like, okay, okay, I'll turn back, God is going to use that, that, that path that we're on for our own judgment. And you'll see that later, well, not today, but. When we get to the end of this story, I'll show you what it says in the New Testament about Balaam. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that this, this path that Balaam has started on is going to end up... This is his own judgment. He has sealed his, mm -hmm. his fate as a false prophet who's, who's, as you said rightly, he wants the money. Balaam's like, but I want, to, I want that silver and gold. I just want somehow to get it. So let me go and ask, you wait here. Let me go and ask God again. Oh God, please, is there some way where I could go and cast them? <laughs> could you change your mind, God? All right, God is now judging Balaam. And he allows Balaam to keep going. But he's also going to bring good out of evil. And there's going to be prophecies here which are going to bless Israel and not curse them. <laughs> anyway. So when Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab on the border formed with the Arnon at the extremity of the border. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not send to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? Balaam said to Balak, behold, I have come to you. Have I now any power of my own to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that must I speak. Then Balaam went with Balak and they came to Kiriath Huzoth. And Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent for Balaam and for the princes who were with him. And in the morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to Bamoth Baal. And from there, he saw a fraction of the people. Dun, dun, uh, and the rest will be tomorrow. Well, not the rest, because it goes on into chapter 24. Whew, this passage is that this part of numbers is just phenomenal but we must the sands of time are sinking we must carry on psalm 62 to the choir master according to jeduthun and according to thirtle that's part of mm -hmm. psalm 61 isn't it if you don't know what i'm talking about you missed yesterday's all right a psalm of david for God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. And what's it like when you've got people like that? You're feeling weak anyway. Do you remember David yesterday <laughs> in Psalm 61? When my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He was feeling weak, wasn't he? And sometimes if you show a little bit of weakness, people and think this is their opportunity to attack you. <laughs> Not if you're God's man. Because if you're God's man like David, 
or God's woman, you're going to, when people are attacking you like this, you're going to wait for God. Even in silence, you're going to humble yourself and say, okay, I'm not going to speak and defend my, I'm going to wait in silence. And they're attacking me. They think that I'm like a leaning wall that you just have to push and it'll fall over. They think I'm like a, um, a tottering fence. And they're trying to push me down from my high position. But I will not be greatly shaken because God is my rock and my fortress and salvation. All right, verse 5. For God alone, my, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. So verse 1, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. Verse 5, for God alone, O oh my soul, wait in, in silence, for from him is my salvation. But he's saying you are waiting in silence. Why are you telling yourself to wait in silence? If you are waiting in silence. Well, that's because actually we need to encourage ourselves to keep doing the right thing. I trust in the Lord. Oh, this is hard. I must keep trusting in the Lord. Come on, my soul, keep trusting in the Lord. You can speak to yourself like that. You can tell yourself like David did. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. So he's telling himself to keep trusting in God. All these people are attacking him, trying to knock him over when he's weak. And he's saying, come on, keep trusting in God. Because he's the only salvation I've got. Now he's going to talk to the people. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Now, put this in the context of Psalm 61 yesterday. When my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. All right. Now he's saying, come on, people. Pour out your heart. Pour out your heart before him. Now, this is what we say, isn't it, to you? We say it to everyone. You've got to learn to pour out your heart before God. If you find it hard to tell other people what's on your heart, you've got to know that God can even understand the groans that you have inside you. And sometimes all I can say to the Lord is, oh, no, no, and I, don't know, I, I can't even express it. But God knows what's going on. I can't even understand fully what's going on inside me. But I'm like, oh, Lord. And it's partly longing. It's partly complaint. It's partly struggle. But God knows. So you've got to learn to pour out your heart before God. This is what it means to come before God in prayer, really. Pour out your heart before him. Just unload what's inside you towards God. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. In other words, they're light as a feather. <laughs> There's nothing to them. They're, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, <coughs> set not your heart on them. Now, that's a really good bit of advice, isn't it? Mm. If riches increase. If you, if you suddenly find yourself gaining a lot of money, do not set your heart on those riches. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. And that you... <coughs> And that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. Wow, Psalm 62, don't you love it? Mm -hmm. Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now that's about Psalm 63, not Psalm 62, because that's not the tune, and it's not saying to the choir master, 
It's just telling us who wrote it and what it was about. That's the top of the psalm. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Huh. Now, um, Donna and Karis are very nervous at this point because they're worried that I'm <laughs> going to sing to you. And I said earlier when we were talking about this, it makes me want to sing. And they both said, no, don't humiliate yourself. <laughs> hmm. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> but let me just tell you, there's a lovely, lovely version of this hymn sung by okay. Fernando Ortega. Fernando Ortega. If you haven't heard Fernando Ortega sing Psalm 63, Google it, YouTube it. You'll hear it, you'll love it, you'll be blessed by it. I so want to sing it to you, but I won't. Thank you. <laughs> So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. No, it doesn't say my soul will be satisfied with fat and rich food. It says my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. <laughs> Sorry, I just got carried away then. <laughs> food for your soul. Of time have gone. Okay, thank you. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king, David's talking about himself, the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. All right, this is David in the wilderness of Judah, it's probably David being chased around by Saul, a dry and thirsty land, and his, he's saying, oh God, I, I long for you, like, like people long for water in a dry and thirsty land. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Mm. You can pray like this, can't you? Uh, can I say this to you? Um, when I remember you in upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, can I say this to you who, who wake up at night? Leave your phone alone unless you're going to turn on the Bible app and read the Bible. Leave your phone alone. Seek the Lord in those watches in the night. Mm -hmm. Pray to him. Learn to draw near to him. And those times where you're kept awake will become wonderful times of fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. I said it a long time ago when, when I was struggling with um, terrible back pain in the night that was keeping me awake. And I just, I was so, so stressed because I desperately needed sleep, but the pain was keeping me awake. And and I just could and then I was, you know, because you're getting tense because you're, you're like, oh, I'm awake again. I need to sleep. I've got to work in the morning and, and it's all just going wrong. And, and I decided then, you know what, I'm just going to take these times to pray. And if the devil's persecuting me for some reason and trying to keep me awake, well, he's going to be foiled because I'm going to pray. <laughs> and so maybe he'll leave me alone. And if God is keeping me awake so I can pray, that's fine. I'll, fit, I'll sit happily within God's will. So I started having the most wonderful prayer times at night. And it wasn't very long before I was able to sleep again. So there's a good bit of counsel from David. All right, we're out of time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are 
the God who blessed David like this, with intimate fellowship with you, with with wonderful trust in you, even though he was going through the most terrible circumstances. Lord, help, help your people, help us to be those who draw near to you, who long for you, who have fellowship with you, even in the middle of great trials. Help us to trust in you and help us to learn to encourage ourselves to keep trusting in you and to encourage each other to keep trusting you, even to be able to wait in silence. Lord, we ask you for your mercy and pray for your blessing on your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are done. God bless you. We'll see you, God willing, if the Lord wills and we live tomorrow. <laughs>